Welcome to Talk Time with Max Contact, the podcast where we talk about the latest contact center and customer experience, industry news, and insights. Join us as we welcome industry experts, discuss actionable strategies you can apply to your business, and help professionals like you on your path to long-term career progression and success. I'm your host, Sean McIver. It's a very special episode this time. We've hit a milestone, 20 episodes, 20 incredible conversations we've had up to this point with a range of amazing individuals from across the entire contact center industry. We've talked about customer experience. We've talked about user experience. We've talked about customer journeys. We've talked about engagement. So what we thought we would do this time around is we would spend some time looking back at some of those key headlines and takeaways so that for those of you who are tackling these really challenging problems in the industry, you got a chance to kind of pull together some of the best bits from conversations we've had with people such as Gary Gormley, founder and CEO of Fab Outsource Solutions, Jane Halton, the group database and contact center manager for Chapel House Motor Group, Katie Stabler, founder and director of Cultivate, and last but by no means least, Kevin Sampson, head of customer excellence at Zen Internet. I hope you enjoy this collection of those key takeaways and look forward to having more conversations with people in the future. Let's get started. I always say, and people do resonate with me when I say this, is as a customer who has interacted with contact centers, as literally millions of people will have, The first thing people tend to do when they pick up the phone to a contact center is, and they heave a big sigh as they start to commence to wait for the agent to pick up the phone. And that's not unusual. Most contact centers that I speak to and that I deal and dial with personally, there is generally a long wait time, especially if it's the energy sector or utilities or your broadband supplier. It seems to take a long time. So when I was crafting the vision statement for for Fab, which is changing customer perceptions about contact centers through delivering awesome customer experiences, I thought about that from the customer's shoes and said, right, actually, it's the customer's perception that more than nine times out of 10 is the most important one. So if we can help change customer perceptions and provide that with a better experience, that has a knock-on impact in terms of how the center is run, how the agents engage with customers, and the experience that they give customers at that point. And the frontline agents are your key and they're your, your lens to all of your brand experience, to all of your customer experience. So if we can make their lives easier by making the customer's lives easier, then it has a knock-on impact in terms of customer experience. And I look at three things when we talk about customer experience and how we can improve and what an amazing customer experience looks like. And it's not bells and whistles It's not providing the best technology and the quickest response time, but it is about making the process that customers have to go through as easy as possible. It's about simplicity. It's about making that process and making that journey as easy as it possibly can be for the customer to do the transaction that they want to do. And it's about giving them choice. It's about giving the customer the options that they want to interact with you. So whether that's through a web chat, whether it's through a chatbot, whether it's through voice, whether it's through email, whether it's through a WhatsApp, allow the customer the choice of how they want to interact with you. And you don't have to have all those options, but you have to consider the customer journey when you think about that and consider the type of interaction that a customer wants to have with you in your contact center. And then the last one for me, it's about probably the speed of resolution. And that's not to say solve everything really, really quick. It's resolve things as quickly as we possibly can within the processes in the confines of what we've got. But do that quickly, do it timely, but be really clear with the next step in the process. But most importantly, and I think this is where most customers get irritated, is follow up. Follow up on that experience, either follow up with the actions that you've set out to do or follow up and ask how that process was. How was that experience with your contact center, with your advisor, with your chatbot, with your web chat? And follow up on that process to close the loop on any gaps that might be arising from a poor experience. Do you think customer follow-up is still underutilized looking at the industry kind of writ large? In pocket, well, let me answer that fully. Yes is the answer in totality. I think it's good in pockets. And but what I've not had happen in my experience in the contact center as a customer 
And what I see in, in contact centers when I'm speaking to them is they don't have the processes in place to do that timely follow-up. So I talk about things like closed loop feedback. So if you imagine your experience as a consumer going through a process, people quite often, they'll ask you for NPS. So they'll say, rate us out of naught to 10. And count the number of times when you've rated anything below a six and how often somebody has actually come back to you and closed the loop and said, oh, why did you rate as a five? Why did you rate as a six? Why did you rate as a four? They don't. And actually, they don't even come back to you if you're rating them highly, if you're nines or tens. Nobody rings it. Great. You've had this fantastic experience. Tell us more about it. We want to give some feedback to the agent to say, really well done and find out what's going on. So when we talk about closed loop feedback on some of the interactions that customers have through some of the mechanisms which we use to define what our um, customer experience is, be that NPS, be it customer satisfaction, be it customer effort scores, we don't go back and close the loop on that. And then we don't do remediation off the back of the problem that they experienced and close the loop on it. So I think in really good contact centers, it's high on the agenda because process improvement is high on the agenda. But I think those centers are probably few and far between. Yeah, I think that's fair. Just very briefly to sidebar, I remember what an experience I had whereby I did have a company close the loop and come back to me. This was several many years ago now, but they did close the loop and come back to me and say, oh, what was the reason for you giving that score? And I had a conversation with somebody who called me. And then what was really interesting was I then got a further closing of that loop as well which actually just reinforced that they'd really thought about that whole journey from end to end, which, yeah, just to back up what you're saying, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, it does improve that feeling valued as an individual, as a customer. It's, um, yeah, it enhances the customer experience, I would agree. Yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. So one of the other things that I wanted to touch on was that within the Fab Group, you mentioned about the four key areas in terms of the work that the Fab do which is people, processes, leadership, and technology. Now, we've talked about some of those. What are the trends in terms of areas for improvement across the contact center landscape at the moment? Where I think there is an opportunity to improve is probably better use of technology, so leveraging technology for what it actually can do. I think what we did when we came out of COVID, or as a consequence of COVID, is we threw lots of bells and whistles at the center because we needed to. So we went to an omni-channel contact sensor solution that's based in the cloud. And what we did is we created all these great tools and real good use of um, technology, but actually we didn't necessarily think it through at the pace that we would probably have thought it through had we been introducing this in, in peacetime, if you like, for example, and say, actually, let's do a full RFP. Let's think about the requirements. Let's think about the use cases. Let's think about the customer journeys. So I think technology is probably one that we can start to think about how can we help that improve customer experience by leveraging what we've got and utilizing to its fullest potential things like a lot of people have got things like speech analytics now or customer sentiment scores. And I think they're probably for some people sitting on the shelf gathering dust because it requires somebody to actively work and build a strategy that tells you about what that key sentiment is at, at certain points within the customer journey analyze some of the phrases and the words, words that are coming out of customers' experience, and then build in a continuous improvement plan around those things so you can actually use it so that it makes a difference and it can actually help save you money, it can improve the customer journey, and it can improve the customer experience overall. So I think there's definitely something that we can do more in respect to leveraging technology. But I think there's also probably some back to basics with it as well at the same time is to say, we need to fix the fundamentals before we start to run with lots of fancy gadgets and fancy AI and fancy technology, because sometimes it's more around, we've not got enough staff, we've got high levels of attrition, we've got too much demand for the supply of agents that we've got. And that, as a consequence, drives high wait times, it drives higher complaints, it drives high agent attrition. So fixing some of those fundamentals is absolutely crucial if we're actually going to start to make any progress because there's no point in having really great technology and really great channels and all these different channels that customers can interact with. If we just simply don't have the staff to handle that demand and we end up having high wait times on web chat or we end up having high wait times on the call queue. So 
we need to fix the fundamentals and then start to work out how technology can support and work alongside some of the improvement measures that we've got so that they we can make the best of both. We have a very, very good commission structure in our team and a lot of the things is worked by a commission. So the team knows exactly what they have to do. And when I get a new team member, I actually learned this trick by visiting a different call centre because I've not come from a call centre background. We have an outside business who provides us with um, products for our upsell. And I got quite friendly with the gentleman who run the team. And he actually arranged for me to go and visit a massive call centre in Birmingham. So we went there for the day. We met with the teams and we kind of shared best practice. And one of their best practices was around a commission structure. When you have an agent start with you for the first time, on the first day, we sit them down and say, right, okay, how much do you want to earn a year? Like, forget what your basic salary is. How much do you want to earn for the year? And they'll say, hmm, about 25 grand. And I'm like, is that all? (laughs) And they're like, what do you mean? So we'll kind of come up with a realistic amount of what they'd like to earn. And we'll then sit down and we'll work that out with the commission structure, what that relates to a day. So how many bookings per day, how many tune-ups, upsells per day, how many service plan sales per day. And we'll work that out to a daily amount so how they can actually earn that potential. And when they see how easy it is to earn like 35, 40 grand and they're like, really? You earn that much money? And then what, what we do every month is we plot this on a daily basis on the board. So we have a big board. We don't have these TVs with red and everything. We have a big board, which we monitor every day. And we put the targets on that for the month. And we also put like how many upsells they've done, so how much then commission they've earned so far that month. And um, we found this motivates the team the best because they can see day to day exactly where they're up to. We split it to a daily amount. So we've got how many bookings per day they need, how many upsells per day they need, how many service plan sales per day they need, and then we mark it off when they hit that target for the day. So each month we sit down and we do like a little 10-minute review where we are this month, have they hit the targets? And if they haven't hit the targets, if they're a little bit behind, what then they need to pull out the bag for next month to get back onto that earning target. So we tend to set their targets around what they want to earn not necessarily what we need for them. Don't get me wrong, we need certain levels for from them, but we also push them to hit their own targets and set their own targets by how much they want to earn. And when they realise the potential, it massively motivates them. Commission isn't all we do. We do lots of other little things. So we have three little spot prizes a month. And what I'll do is We do that tend to be on the bookings, but some months we do it on our upsell, some months we do it on service plans, but it's mainly around bookings. So say we need 2,000 bookings a month, for example. I will pick three numbers and I'll write them down in a little envelope. And what we'll do throughout the month, when somebody hits that particular number, so it's not individual, it's just a group, the next person to get that particular number wins a spot prize. So it, it can go from anything to can of pop and sauce and sweets to sign rugby shirt so it can go from numerous different things and they all know this is coming they don't know what the numbers are there's only me that knows that so as we're going through the month i can say oh we might get a bit close today there might be a prize today so it works them a bit more and then i'm like oh we didn't quite get there it was going to come tomorrow so we do little spot prizes through the month at christmas we do an advent challenge we have a big sack what we call Santa sack and we fill it with rubbish. <laughs> so we fill it with yo-yos and sweets and crisps. And for the girls, we have nail polishes and lipsticks and just little bits of things. But whoever sells the most upsell that day gets to pick a prize. And the lads love the yo-yos. <laughs> but it just keeps things really fun and it keeps it motivation, it keeps it fresh. And that's the hardest thing with us. Working in a call centre, everybody knows you get numerous people. We're an outbound call centre. So we get numerous voicemails after voicemail after voicemail. And sometimes their mood can go a little bit low in the afternoon. So it's trying to keep that focus and keep them motivated and having all these little prizes and different things to just keep them going. 
It's really interesting that you've mentioned that. It was one of the things that I wanted to bring up, particularly within a sales contact center or a support contact center, but you do see across the industry is you see these peaks and troughs of various levels of the business and throughout the course of the day, week, month, year, from overall performance of the business all the way down to an individual level. And I kind of think of it as like breathing, In the contact center, you take these breaths in and breaths out. And one of my questions that you just answered really nicely, I think, is how you encourage that continued drive when you do start to feel a little bit breathless. I think that combination of that culture and the communication and that fun that you have to inject into it it all feeds into that, which I find really, really interesting. On that note, though, I'm just going to unpack one of the other questions that I had. Within a team, and I've seen this personally. So within a team, you always have your top flight team members who hit absolutely everything all the time. And then you've got those who somewhat struggle sometimes and other times do very, very well. How do you ensure a team mentality that's got a collective winner's mindset rather than it becoming down to an individual? Um, I mean, we have individual targets and we also have a group target. And we do have one particular member of staff that actually smashes it out of the ballpark every single month. And um, they're earning a few grand commission every month, and that's noted on the board. And then we have other members of staff who are just not as experienced, not as good at the sales technique. But what I tend to do is I have our top sellers mentor a little bit. So we are quite a small team, and we are all based in the one office. So we're quite lucky in that respect. They kind of listen out little things on the calls and we do little bits of mentoring sessions. Also what we do, so our managing director, every now and again we'll pop in and he'll sit us all in the boardroom and he'll play a few calls between the teams and we'll have it as a little game. So we'll play some of the calls and the little game is we have to all write down on a little pad, write three good points about that call and three bad points about the call And when this first started, everybody was like, oh, no, no, don't let it be my call. Don't let it be my call. And it was very like, oh, I don't want to hear my voice. And But now they actually find it really good because they're like, oh, I did that really well. And oh, I could have done that better. But it makes them think. And because the managing director is sat in front of them saying this, I mean, we're lucky because our managing director used to be the group after sales manager and it's his way up the business. So we've got a very, very, very good relationship with him. So that's why he tends to come in and do this because it's something he started when he joined the business. And like I say, when it first started, they really wasn't into it. But now it's become a real challenge and they look forward to that session and they look forward to pleasing him in a way. It's like, oh, I did that really well. But as well, it lets the other people know because if you can listen to both sides of the call, then you can understand it a little bit better. And each one of my team do things very, very differently. We're not scripted because I don't find that works very well um, for us personally. We're trying to build that rapport with each customer and every customer is different. We have multi-franchises in our business as well. So some franchises, their customers are different categories to other franchises. So nothing, scripting just doesn't work for us. But we'll find by playing these calls and making the little notes about what was good about the call, what could have been better, what was slightly negative. People learn different ways of how others are dealing with things. And then that gives that them the incentive and the knowledge to think, oh, I remember Adam said this. Well, I'll say that. <laughs> and it really works. And we do listen to the others. And we always, if somebody's particularly struggling, we always say communicate, communicate, communicate. Don't sit there and struggle. Put your hand up, shout one of us. We will always help you because the senior members of the team will always help the newer members. We have quite a new girl with us who was actually in the sales department, wasn't happy there, didn't really like it, and has come and joined us in the call centre. And she's doing really, really well, but she does need that little bit of extra support because she's not done it. So some of the other guys are jumping on when they hear on the calls, they're just like, oh, so it's just that little bit of mentoring really we find that really works and listening to calls as a group i really love talking about communication in customer experience because almost to your point before about how nobody goes into work to do a bad job it just kind of applies to the conversation of communication we all communicate nobody specifically sets off to upset or frustrate anybody yet we take for granted 
how important thoughtful communication is. And this applies internally and externally. So to internally the people you work with and externally to your customers. We are so busy, our day-to-day doing, and we are often on autopilot, that our level of communication, unlike marketing, which is very, very specific, it's very well curated, it's designed for specific intent. Outside of marketing, all of our communication just tends to happen. And we might have some good customer service training in relation to, you know, active listening and the kind of responses a company wants somebody to take. But we forget about some of the deeper things that happen in communication, i.e. the neuroscience involved, the way that our emotions trigger things, perhaps unintendedly. We also forget about the psychology of communication and again, how it connects to our emotion and how actually we can design the way in which we communicate to deliberately elicit the kind of emotion we want our communicate, uh, the person we're speaking to, to actually feel. And although that might see really big and broad and perhaps too much of a thought process to go through with everybody in the organization, I actually find taking a step back and just a 30-minute workshop on the psychology, the neuroscience, the impact of our communication is incredibly thought-provoking. And it just, again, changes the mentality of how we approach communication in an organization. And one of the biggest things, actually, which I think to maybe bring that down to more specifics, is the empathy gap. So for anybody who's unfamiliar with the empathy gap, it's where, well, there's different versions of the empathy gap, but one of which is where we are in a position of knowing. So maybe we're subject matter experts or something, and we're talking to somebody who isn't in a position of knowing, but we make assumptions about their knowledge and therefore we miss knowledge gaps. And it's accidental. We don't intend to upset or frustrate or make somebody feel embarrassed about lack of knowledge. But just the way in which we speak can do that, can create that. And with some minor adjustments and some additional thought into, again, the communication and the the recipient of our communication can have a significant impact on the customer experience of that interaction. So one example of why it's so important. So I've got a bit of a vested interest in this topic, actually, because I've been doing some reading around communication styles and some other stuff kind of in my own personal life. So I've been looking into things like stoicism, true stoicism, and I've also been looking at things like neurolinguistic programming, NLP. So just to kind of expand on what we mean by thoughtful communication and the choice of language specifics, the structuring of what we're wanting to achieve, Is that what we're referencing when we mean thoughtful communication? Just so I'm really clear on that. Yeah, absolutely. Again, it's just that stepping out of the autopilot, which we often find ourselves in for whatever reason. It's stepping out of that and actually being very mindful, very present and very considerate in that conversation. And again, one of the, when I'm delivering this kind of training, one of the things I lean back on to get across the the point of why that's so important is again, related to the neuroscience. So our amygdala in our brains sat there just ticking away, happy as Larry until something triggers it. And that can be good or bad. And how easily that is triggered depends on our emotions that day, our capacity, whether or not we've just had six screaming children tugging at our tails for the last hour. Lots of things can influence our mood. And it's that ability to recognize that if, for example, let's just say we're a customer service agent on the phone to a customer explaining something relatively simple or which should be relatively simple and not really listening to the cues that actually that customer, no matter how simple this is, they're not in a position to get what you're saying right at this moment in time. And actually you have to take a step back and empathize with the situation and maybe change the approach in your communication. And it's that kind of mindful thoughtfulness, which again, not just applies in customer service, but applies to our internal communication with our internal stakeholders. And that was the point I was kind of going to make off the back of that, because the more that you recognize and improve on that skill of empathic, thoughtful communication with customers, it's like the neural pathways get trodden down more and you're more engaged and more able to leverage those when you're then having internal communication conversations. So am I right in assuming that as you improve that skill set, actually you'll enhance the internal communication by proxy as well? Absolutely. And there's no reason why you shouldn't. And It all comes back to that emotional IQ and emotional intelligence. And 
that isn't natural to everybody. We don't all have that skill set, but it can be nurtured. And it is just with practice. And obviously, the more you do it in one context, in one setting, hopefully, the more you're going to do it in another. It does require discipline and it requires stepping out of your BAU mindset to be able to do that, which is why from a customer service perspective, from a training perspective, I mean, even an internal training perspective, this is an opportunity to look at it from a slightly different lens. So it isn't just your usual, like, you know, active listening skills, passive listening, avoidance. It's got some more depth to it, the real understanding. There are overlapping um, factors between customer experience and customer excellence. But for me, customer excellence is all about making sure that everything we do and how we operate is all done with the single goal of making sure the customer achieves their desired outcome. And so to do that, you often need to know and often change so much about your business to meet the constantly changing and evolving needs and expectations of your, your customers. So what we've done differently with customer excellence versus previous customer experience role is bring together all of those sources of insight and all the ways that you can then use that insight to deliver impactful and sustainable change in a way that improves things for your customers in one place. So often these functions are in different areas and different divisions within a business and can't work as well together as they can in what we have as a customer excellence function. So that means bringing together complaints, root cause analysis and insights. So for every single complaint that we receive, we perform root cause analysis on that complaint. We understand what happened to that customer, to that connection on every single complaint that we receive. We bring that together with quality assurance insight. We bring that together with our customer experience metrics and insight that we get from NPS and CSAT measurement, for example. And we bring that together in what we turn the insight engine and we feed that into a change function that change function delivers opportunities, delivers fixes, delivers process changes, communication changes, anything that solves that problem for that customer. And then within the same team, we have measurement as well. So we continue to monitor the customer experience, our internal process KPIs and measurements to make sure that the what we found from the insight and delivered through the change has had the impact that we wanted it to have through the measurement that we then have at the back end, the benefit realisation. So that to us, bringing all of that together is how we strive for and achieve customer excellence. Crikey. So it sounds like that was quite an undertaking to go through and kind of amalgamate all of that information into a, a data set or a story, if you like, shall we say, that was meaningful and insightful. How did you go about collecting information and data to analyze those moments of great customer experience? Yeah, bringing all of that data together was a little bit of a challenge because, of course, it comes from a number of different sources. So there's been a number of ways in which we've done that. Some of it is, is done manually and some of it is done through uh, the use of our CRM platform that we have. That's been a huge step forward in allowing us to bring all of this together in one place. What we found or what I found from experience, I think, is that you can't always trust a dashboard, for example, to tell you everything that you need to know about that customer story. You can't always rely um, solely on a, on a metric, on a score, um, to tell you everything that you need to know. So we do have we do have people within the team who analyze and interpret the verbatims that our customers give us um, to help us understand our opportunities for fixes, for growth, for improvement. So that's been quite an undertaking to bring together that the number of different sources where data is in such, such different formats as well to help it, to help us understand that story and what our opportunities are. So you have a huge data set that you've unified, standardized, sanitized, and distilled down into metrics that you're able to understand. Then you've had people who are able to then dive into that and understanding some of the key indicators and some of the key points on those. How, with this data set, do you then ensure that your team are able to walk the experience of the customer, so to speak? Yeah, walking the experience of our customers. So from this data, the teams can understand so much about what our customers tell us but in terms of walking the experience 
all of the team are customers of our business as well. So they they experience everything that our customers experience as well. They use the same service, they use the same technology, they have the same hardware in their homes, they receive the same communications. So they have a the best experience system as best they can, see what our customers see and feel, how our customers feel. So that's possibly one of the ways in which they want the experience for the customer. Another way in which they do so, equally if not more valuable maybe, is how can we bring customers into our business as well? So when we want to launch a new product, a new proposition, we need to change something, be it because of a, a regulatory change that we need to deliver and behave differently. We are the development of a new mobile app, actually. That's a really good example to use where we did this, is we bring customers into the business. We invite customers from our customer panel, or sometimes we go out to a broader network of customers and ask customers if they'd like to, to be involved. And we sit in a room with those customers, sometimes physically, sometimes virtually and talk to them about how they view a particular journey, maybe, that they, they go through with Zen, or how they want to interact with us. When we were designing the, the mobile app, we brought customers into a room and talked to them about what their needs and expectations were, what delighted them about the use of. And we didn't focus on telco. We actually asked them, what do you want from your mobile banking? What do you want from your energy provider? We used not so much the transaction they wanted to complete, but what they wanted to do, the goal they wanted to reach. And we translated that into what we're here to deliver and how we could deliver that same same great moment, that same touch point for, for our customers. And I think if we didn't do this so much as a business and hadn't done it so often, where we have done it in the design stages of projects and products that we've done in the past, we would so easily have ended up designing something or building something that wasn't what our customers wanted. It was what we thought our customers wanted. And I've seen that be two very different things in the past. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that those insights and those headlines have been really useful. By listening to back to some of these episodes, it's really helped me understand some of these themes and trends that have been really coming through throughout these conversations that we've been having over these last few months. And I hope that as we move forward with the incredible and really exciting guests that we've got lined up in the coming weeks, that you'll continue to listen with us as we explore these really challenging topics and conversations. Until then, Thank you very much for listening and catch you next time. Talk Time is brought to you by Max Contact. To find out more about Max Contact and how our customer engagement software can help you and your teams provide smarter customer experiences, visit maxcontact.com and book your personalized demo today. Be sure to search Talk Time with Max Contact in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found and leave us a positive rating to help other like-minded individuals join the conversation. Finally, before you go, never miss a future episode by clicking the subscribe button and turning on notifications. On behalf of the team here at Max Contact, thanks for listening.